For the next eight weeks, we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. In particular, the first few verses of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters long. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's Jesus' inaugural uh, sermon. It is his first public sermon to the masses. And it's interesting because he sets the foundation in the course of his ministry and his hope for his people. Hear me, hear me, hear me. He he sets the course for his hope for his people. There, There was a desire, there's a hope that Christ has for those who are his people. Are you all with me? Now you gotta understand, he was talking to folks that weren't his people yet. But he was saying, I see that you're not even connected with me, but I see some stuff that I want for you. If you connect with me, you'll get it. And it's interesting that that his first sermon was not about material possessions or power or position or prestige. His first sermon, his first public sermon, he opens up with this thing called the Beatitudes. And we know the Beatitudes. We learn the Beatitudes, many of us, in our, in our um, vacation Bible school or Sunday class. And, and we know, and I want to take each one one by one. The first Beatitude uh, spoken by Jesus is in Matthew 5. And you have your sermon notes. You should see these in your sermon notes or see this one. In your, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Listen, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Watch this. He, he says that those who are poor in spirit will be blessed. And I'll talk about what it means to be poor in spirit, but we need to look at this word blessed or blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? The, the word blessed is, comes from the Greek word uh, makar, and it means to be supremely happy. Some translation you'll see happy are the poor in spirit. Uh, The King James Version says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Another translation is, supremely happy are those who are poor in spirit. Stop. Jesus' first words to his future disciples and those who would build a church on his teachings, he says, my desire is not that you be broke per se, financially, uh, materialistically. He says, I'm not not saying that. I'm not saying that you need to be broke in your body and poor uh, in your bank account. He says not. He says, but if you want to be blessed, you need to be poor in spirit. Are you all with me? If if you want to be happy, it doesn't come from those stuff. How many of y'all know that stuff won't make you happy? No, 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 that's the wrong, no, 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 that's the wrong question. How many of y'all got some stuff and know that stuff won't make you happy? If you ain't got no stuff, you can't even raise your hand up in here. eh? I'm just saying, I'm just just saying, you know, brother's broke and be like, yeah, I don't don't make that. Amen. And and so I want to I want to kind of enter this 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 text, enter this message like this. So last night, yesterday, my daughters told me um, that they wanted to go to Six Flags. And and, you know, for me, how many of y'all? Did, never went to Six Flags when you were a kid. You went to Magic Mountain. So I went to Magic Mountain. They call it Six Flags now. They I want to go to Six Flags. And so, and I told them, y'all can get out there. I'll come get you. And they figured out how to get there. <laughs> Tanisha tells me I need to shut my mouth sometimes. I talk too much. I talk way too much. I'm going to just say I talk way too much. So, she, so, so they, they figured out how to get out there. And then as they're getting out there, they reminded me that, you know, this is the Halloween season of Six Flags. It don't close at nine o'clock. Close at midnight. It closed at 1 a.m. On a Saturday night. And Tanisha just kind of looks at me like, hmm. Long as you back by eight o'clock tomorrow morning. That's all that matters up in there. Like, you going to ride with me? <laughs> Long as you back <laughs> by 8 o'clock. All right, so, 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 so as I'm driving out to Magic Mountain at 10 o'clock last night and sat in the parking lot of the hotel down the hill from Magic Mountain, sleeping and scared and... 
the saying, a brother in the parking lot in Valencia, midnight, I mean, that kind of hard to explain. But anyway, I, be, I began to think about uh, when I was a kid and all the stuff I used to do at Magic Mountain and the roller coasters, and, and I started thinking about it, and, and, and I started seeing people leave and they had big stuffed animals at the end. And I remember this one game that I never would win, but I always would try to play. It was like, like it's called uh, Whack-A-Mole. Anybody remember that game? Well, you, well, you know, you, you, you start and you got these two things and, and a mole pops up and you got to whack it. And then, and then you got to whack another one. And it's funny because you whack it, it goes down, and then two come up. Then you whack the two, and then two more come up. And then you whack it, and then you realize stuff is just popping up, popping up, popping up, and you can't whack them all. And, and sometimes I think that's what Jesus was saying to us in the Sermon on the Mount. He says we got issues. We got hurts. We got habits. And we all got hang-ups. And, and, and when we think that we have dealt with one, something else pops up. When we think we dealt with these two, three more things pop up. Come on, somebody. When, 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 you, when, you, when you get a pay cut and everything at home is nice and you, you deal with the pay cut, then your honey start tripping. Come on, somebody. And then when your honey is tripping and your money is funny, come on, somebody. Ain't nothing happy or blessed going on in your life. How many of y'all feel like your life is like a, a, a whack-a-mole that, that as soon as you think you knock something out, something else pops up? In other words, let me translate, we all got issues. And some of y'all get upset with me and some of y'all judge me. And when I talk about I'm a brother with serious and significant issues, every time I try to deal with one thing, something else pops up. And I need you to understand that we can't fix ourselves. And there's nobody in here who is issueless. Last week, or last week, I, I don't know, Mark, if you got that slide, the one that I talked about what the church is. You know, y- y'all church folks are a trip. <laughs> Let me tell you how y'all a trip. Y'all church folks are a trip. You go around talking about a God who can do anything. And then you complain about everything. You Christians, you church folks are a trip. You a trip, you come in this place, you dress up, clean up, comb up, curl up, put on your hair. You put on your Sunday's best and you act like you ain't got whack-a-moles popping up all over the place. You act like this the place for people who used to have issues versus people who still have issues. And we come into God's house and we're lying because we're not transparent. Are y'all with me on that? How many of y'all know I'm telling the truth? And, and, and it's interesting because because even Paul, who is the greatest Christian other than Jesus, maybe in all of the Bible, listen, he says it this way in Romans 7, 15 and verse 18. Look at your look at your text. It says it says, I don't understand what I do for what I want to do. I don't do. But what I hate to do, I do. I know that nothing good lives in my sinful what? I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. In other words, he says that I got issues and yet I am uh, carrying the gospel all over the land. He says, I got I got stuff popping up and coming all around me. And yet he says, I am entrusted to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. In other words, some commentators try to say, well, you know, this is he was talking about his life. Formerly. He wasn't talking about his current life. But let me tell you, the verb in this Greek is the present progressive tense, meaning he's talking in the present and he's talking in the future. He says, I have issues and I'm going to continue to have issues unless I'm poor in spirit. And I explain what that means. He says, these issues are going to take control. And let me show you some of the issues that he talks about. He talks about fear and stress and diet and finances and worry. Anybody got issues with their diet? Relationships, your overwork, bad habits, painful memories. Uh, you got all these attractions to things that you shouldn't be attracted to. You're angry. You're mad. You got a bad attitude. You're a perfectionist. You're addicted. You're dishonest. We are all uh, resentful and we have compulsive thoughts and we have regrets. And some of us and all of us and maybe everyone needs to have control. Paul was not talking in the past tense. He wrote two thirds 
of the entire New Testament, and yet he confesses that he has issues. Let me ask you again, how many of y'all got issues? Thank you. How many of y'all ain't got none? If you ain't got none, you're lying, you're in denial, or you're God. Let me, let me walk through this real quick. So the, what's the cause of all um, our issues? What is the cause of all of our imperfections, our resentments, our, our stresses, our worries? Write this down. The cause is we try to play God. I'm going to tell you now, it's going to get ugly in here, but it's going to get clean. I'm going to clean it up in a minute, all right? Amen. We try to play God. Listen to what it says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am God, but you are just a man and not a God, though you think you are as wise as God. Listen, I want you to understand that the fault of man is because our desire to be like God. Satan came to Adam and Eve, and he didn't say, you want to be like me? Don't nobody want to be like Satan? He says, you want to know and be like who? God. And it was too tempting. When we try to be like God, we have issues. All right, yeah, yeah. And so I want to talk about eight choices, and the first choice is the choice, the reality choice. And it says this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven, all that God has for you is there for those who are poor in spirit. And let me say, let me tell you what, what poor in spirit means. Poor in spirit means blessed are those who recognize they, that they are spiritually helpless. That we cannot help ourselves. That our problems are bigger than us. And no matter how many times you go to Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and find the self-help section, you will never find help for yourself because you can't help yourself. If you could help yourself, you wouldn't be up in here. Amen. So the first thing that we must do is I must admit I need help. That's um, that, that, that I'm powerless to control my tendencies. I'm powerless to control my wrong ways of doing things. I'm powerless to control my unmanageable life. Write this down. The first thing you must do is humbly admit that I, we, need help. How many of y'all can control your thoughts? How many of y'all can control your appetite? How many of y'all can control your temper? How many can you control your impulses? We must first admit that we are powerless. Listen, and that it is our pride and our arrogance that gets us in this mess. We have to humble ourselves and say, God, we need help. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James tells us this. He will, he, uh, you will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. He says, confess them and give them up. Then God will show mercy to you. That's Proverbs 28 and 13. Listen to me. That we must first admit that we don't have it all. You know, I, I, I used to fall into this trap and, you know, uh, someone asked me, you know, why do you tell, and, and, and you know, my family be like, why do you always tell your business? You know, you know, we know you got issues, but you shouldn't tell everybody your business. And I said, people need to know I got issues. Amen. Amen. So when I cuss you out, you can already say, <laughs> he said he had issues, right? <laughs> Let the church say amen. amen. So if I slip, right? But, but, but the problem is, only God is perfect. And when we think that we're perfect, we close ourselves to God's help. We close ourselves um, to being um, humble, and we close ourselves to being helped, and we open ourselves to being prideful and arrogant, and we shut off the mercy and the grace that God wants to give us. And I told you last week that grace is the oil that keeps the engine running smoothly. Listen, y'all, grace is unearned, um, unmerited, 
uh, divine favor. And it means that God is moving on your half and that relationships cannot work without grace. And you remember a motor, oil in a motor, it takes parts that are meant to work together and keep them running smooth. But when there's no oil in the motor, those things that were designed to work together begin to destroy each other. If we are in relationship with one another and we don't have grace and we don't have mercy, we begin to turn on each other because we all got issues. Y'all with me on that? Keep going. Let me, give, let me give you a little bit more. We must admit that we are broken and that we cannot help ourselves. We need to admit um, that our secrets make us weak. We must admit that our secrets make us weak. What are you talking about, Reverend? Well, Psalm two, uh, 32 says, when we hold in our secret sins, um, the Bible says, uh, when I refuse to confess my sins, I am weak. I am miserable and I groan all day long. Um, my strength is evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confess my sins to you and I stopped trying to hide them all. And you forgave me of all my guilt has gone and all my guilt has gone away. When we confess our sins, we are no longer weak. We are strong. Listen to me. We, we, we know we got issues. And we try to hide our issues. Now, I'm not telling you to bleed all over the place and give all your business to everybody, but you spend more energy trying to protect yourself of hide from your sins versus confessing them and the guilt has gone away. How many of you all other than me struggle with admitting that you got issues? Let me see your hands. Thank you. Listen to me. If we can't confess that we have issues, that we have hurts, that we have habits, that we have hangups. We are operating in a weakened state. And let me tell you what's the next thing, you know, we must admit it to defeat it. If we don't admit it, we can't defeat it. We must admit it to what? You will never be successful, the psalmist tells us. And you do want to be successful. You will never be successful in life if you're not going to admit your sins. When you try to hide your sins, it keeps us from being successful. You're going to be um, fighting against God when we, when we don't admit our sins, and if we admit it, we can defeat it. Let me tell you something. When we don't admit our sins, and we don't understand that we are weak, how can we ever address something that we don't admit we have? I have a friend who told me, um, he gonna tell me this. Um, he says, man, my doctor told me, trying to tell me, I got diabetes. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? I'm serious. And I said, what prompted him to say that? <laughs> he said, man, I took a blood test. And he's going to try to tell me. And I said, why would he just tell you that? They be trying to make you take medicine. All they want to do is make you take medicine. And his body has turned on him. And he's dying each and every day because he won't admit there's an issue. Some of you are just like my friend. You have a spiritual issue. You can't forgive. You have resentment. You got anger. And it's killing you each and every day. And Jesus says, blessed are those who recognize that they're unable to help themselves. Are you all with me on this? Amen. The second thing is I must be honest and let everybody know that my pride and my fears keep me stuck. Listen to what Adam said in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. He says, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Listen to me. Our pride makes us hide our sins versus confess our sins. Write this down for those who, who like to take notes. 
If you tell it, it's a testimony. If someone else tells it, it's gossip. You control the narrative. Don't let folks gossip about you. You tell folks. You let folks know that you got issues and don't hide your stuff. I remember uh, some of the stuff I said in my interview. Um, um, uh, when, I was past, when I was trying to pastor the first church and coming here, and I, I talked about some of the things that I couldn't hide that was going to come out anyway, and I shared them, and everybody stopped and looked at me like, And I said, next question, please. <laughs> because if I tell it, it's a what? If you tell it, it's what? Let's move on. Listen to me. It says, because of our pride and fear, we try to fix ourselves. But Jeremiah says it this way. My people have committed two kinds of sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of life. I am the spring well of life, and you have forsaken me. He says, and, and he says, um, I am the one who got all the answers and you won't come to me. But he says they have dug their own um, uh, broken wells. They have dug their own broken, broken cisterns and they cannot hold water. He says when we try to fix ourselves, he says we can't hold water. Our wells are broken, our vats are broken, and we can't hold water. So the second thing we must do in order to have the reality, the first reality check is that we are broken. The second is we must humbly ask God for help. We saw how powerless we were to help ourselves, but those, but that was God. Uh, but that was good. I'm sorry. I don't know why I can't read this morning. He says, he says, we saw how powerless we were to help ourselves, but that was good. For then we put everything in the hands of God. Listen. When we admit that we're broken and we can't help ourselves, that's when we see only God. Amen. And that's when God does his best work. Amen. Do, you have to wait until, do you have to wait until you're totally broken? Do you have to wait until you have broken every relationship? Do you have to wait until you are down and out before you turn and admit that God, you need God's help? I told you this is going to be rough. I'm sorry. But he says, blessed when you are at the end of your rope with less of you, then there's more of God and God's love. We must humbly ask God for help. Have you ever been in a situation where no one can help you? Have you ever been in a situation where you, where you can't think your way out? You can't pray your way out? You can't, um, you can't street your way out? You can't Google your way out? and that you're only left with you and God. God says if you want to be blessed and happy, you got to recognize that only God can help you out of your situation. Y'all with me on that? All right. So we must humbly confess and admit that we need help. We must humbly ask God for help. Lastly, we must humbly accept help from others. Two are better than one because they have good return on their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity to the man who falls and has no one to help him up. In other words, we need people that we can talk to. We need folks that we can share with. We need folks who are going to pray for us. We need folks who are going to understand us. We need folks who are going to be in the thing. A real friend, when you get in trouble, fake friends run out of your life. A real friend runs into your life. Who do you call and who can you depend upon when you have messed up, when you, have, when you are broke, busted, and disgusted? And God says that we must humbly accept others because God sends others our way, but our pride won't let us share. Our anger won't let us share. Our frustration won't let us share. And I'll tell you that you won't be anything, uh, you won't ever be healthy and whole if you can't allow others to help you. The Bible tells us in James 5 and 16, admit your faults one to another and pray for each other so that you may be what? That we will always be sick if we hold stuff in. I was having a conversation just the other day with someone who I care deeply about and he told me, he says, I don't have anyone I can talk to. Pitch, you talk to everybody. You don't care. I don't share that because people would judge me. And let me tell you, there are three fears that Satan um, um, uses to keep us stuck with our pain, keep us broken. Don't you understand that God wants us whole? Don't you understand that God wants us um, um, 
free, that God wants us to live a life that is abundant, that God wants us to be happy, but yet Satan used these tools to keep us. The first tool that Satan used to keep us stuck and in a rut um, is the fear of our own emotions. Write that down, the fear of our own emotions. And let me tell you what that means, the fear of our own emotions. I'm almost finished. The fear of our own emotions. We're afraid to accept that we're broken because we don't know if we can handle how we're going to respond. My dear friend, who I told you, he won't deal with his medical issue because he's afraid of what he has to do. He's afraid that he doesn't have enough strength. He's afraid of the pain and the admitting that he has brought himself to that place because of his own bad habits. Some of us can't go back and, and forgive others and ask for forgiveness because we know that we have messed folks up and we got to face our own emotional pain in order to deal with the healing. How many of y'all won't talk to someone because you don't want to go back to that place? How many of y'all won't go certain places and go in certain environments because it's too painful for you? Let me tell you something. That's a trick of Satan. Your healing, your healing comes from going back and facing those same things that are tough. Let me share this with you real quick. You know this story, and I'll just make it plain for those who are coming. I remember um, my junior year in college, Tiffany going into my senior year in San Diego State. I had made a mess of my life, a mess of it. It wasn't, it wasn't my friends. It wasn't my cousins. It wasn't because I wasn't kissed enough as a baby. Come on, somebody. It wasn't, it, was, it wasn't, right? It was nobody's fault. It was all mine. I made decisions, Kirkwood. I made decisions that ostracized uh, people that I love. I made a decisions that I didn't have enough money to even have a place to live. And I was so toxic that my closest friends like, look, man, we love you, but we just need to take a break from you. It wasn't their fault, it was mine. And so I went to the one place that I knew that I would get solace. The one place I knew I had help and hope. The one place that had always gotten the answers. I called my mama. I called my mama and it was a collect call. I know y'all young folks don't know what a collect call is. Eh? And my mama, you know, and it was, you know, and, and I, I called her, collect, and, 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 and she took the charges, and I was at a phone booth. <laughs> Sean D, you don't know nothing about phone booths. And, uh, and here's what we do. Don't judge me. I'm just telling you, I got issues. So I called my mom, and she said, okay, what's the number you at? I said, I'm at 619, da 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 hung up the phone, and she calls me back, because it's cheaper to her to call me than to call collect. Y'all know nothing about that. How many of y'all remember those days? And so, Damani, I talked to my mom. I said, Mom, my life is a mess. And I said, I got this going on, I got this going on, this going on. And she always says this. She says, well, well who's responsible for, who got you here? You know, she says, I said, well, Mom, it's me. I got it. I said, don't worry about it, Mom. I got it. I got it taken care of. I have put in transfer papers. I'm going to finish my last year in L.A. I'm going to live at home. I said, because it's hard. And my mama said, well, baby, <laughs> you can always come home. Mi casa, su casa, huh? She said, but I didn't know I raised a quitter. She said, how about this? Why don't you stay there? Clean up the mess you made. And then come home. Translation, face your fears. And when my mama, my savior, turned me down ever so gently, I was left to trust only in God. I couldn't be God. I couldn't find God in human flesh. And I had to trust God. 
And that time in my life, I share it openly and honestly because I had to face the emotional fears of the pain of the situation that I created. How many of you all are still afraid to deal with the mess that you made? Don't raise your hand. I know as many of us. Our choices, our decisions, our attitude, our behaviors have caused us to have these things. And Satan uses our emotions to keep us, listen, from moving forward. The second thing that Satan does is that he uses fear of the reaction of others. He doesn't want us to share our faults. He doesn't want us to confess our sins to one another because Satan wants us to hold on to it. And as we hold on to it, it begins to kill us on the inside just like cancer, just like diabetes, just like any other disease that's killing us. And we're afraid to tell others because we think we'll get rejected. We think we'll get judged. We think we're going to be thought of less than if we share our faults. How many of y'all know I'm telling the truth that you don't share with nobody because you don't want anyone to think less of you? You don't want to be rejected. You don't want to be judged. You don't want to be looked at differently. And yet God says, we must confess our sins to one another, and you'll be surprised at the very people who you think would judge you are the very people that would throw their arms around you and love you. God will give you the discernment who you can share with. Listen to me. This is the hardest message. The other ones get easier. When you're poor in spirit, you recognize you're helpless. And that you need help from others. And that you must admit that you have an issue. You must ask God for help, but you also must let others help you. And in the way to let others help you, you can't be afraid if they're going to reject you. How many times, watch this, you being on the receiving, how many times has someone come to you with an issue and they come to you and you said, if I wish you would have come sooner, I could have helped. Confess your sins one to another, and don't worry about the reaction of others. We are all broken vessels. And here's the last one. There's a fear that being honest is useless. Why be honest? It doesn't change anything. It doesn't help anything. And I'm going to tell you, honesty it's not about what others think. Honesty is about freeing you of the guilt and the shame that is killing you from the inside out. As we look at our last passage of Scripture, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are, una when we are unable to help ourselves, at that very moment, we're in our greatest need. We have to remember that Christ died for us. I was talking to a young man a couple months ago. He was going through some serious and significant issues and he didn't want to confess, he didn't want to admit what was going on in his life. And I said to him, I said, hey man, don't you know when you confess your sins and when you admit, um, you can change your whole narrative around. He says, I don't know anyone who's ever been honest and the narrative have, has changed, has been changed for the better. I said, really? He says, yeah, I don't know anyone. Tell me someone. I said, I just started thinking about that. Marion Barry, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, come on somebody. <laughs> Richard Nixon. And yeah, I'm telling all these folks, when you confess your sins and when you don't try to hide, the folks who get in the most trouble are the ones who like Barry Bonds and, and um, and um, Roger Clemens, our, our Hall of Famers, are not in Hall of Famers because they won't admit what they have done. But yet others get in places that they should be disqualified from because they share their story. Pete Rose, not getting in. Why? Why? He won't admit. What doors are closed because you won't admit your fault? What luxuries are yours because you won't admit your fault? What pains do you carry because you won't admit your fault? I'm going to pray for you now. 
Jesus died on the cross so that we would have no guilt and no shame. Will you pause for a moment just think about all the stuff that we hide, our lying, our cheating, our stubbornness, our pride, our overeating, our overdrinking, our overworrying. How many of y'all want to be free? The three-step process. Admit your sins, ask God for help, allow others to help you. I promise you, it'll make a difference.